Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Phoenix, Arizona, it's time for Phoenix Business Radio, spotlighting the city's best businesses and the people who lead them. Welcome, everyone, to Project Management Office Hours, the number one live project management radio show in the U.S., broadcasting to you today from Phoenix, Arizona, and the business Phoenix Business Radio X studios. I'm your host, Joe Puzz, PMO Joe, and for the next hour, we'll be talking project management with our special guests. also want to say thank you to our sponsors, the PMO Squad. PMO Squad is home of the Purpose Driven PMO. While most professional service firms focus on the what and the how, the Purpose Driven PMO is focused on the why. As we have seen with all of the data we get in the industry, PMOs have an average lifespan of two to four years because we're focused on agile versus waterfall and the different types of characteristics of our PMO, but not why we have a PMO and who we're serving. To look for more information on the Purpose Driven PMO and the PMO Squad, visit www.thepmosquad.com. Also want to take a moment here to mention on our last show, I had talked about the International Institute of Learning's 2019 Online Leadership and Innovation Summit. That is active, uh, started uh, a couple weeks back, and it runs through June 9th. And in association with our Veterans Mentoring Program, they have given us the ability to offer access to that conference for free to veterans. So all veterans out there, you can go out to the IIL.com, look for the link to the conference, enter the code VETMENT, V-E-T-M-E-N-T, and you will have free access to all the presentations, speeches, uh, and information that's out there. Uh, One last item of note for everybody, I also want to mention the Southwestern Ontario PMI Chapters 2019 Symposium is coming up on April 25th. This is the 16th year for that symposium. The theme this year is The Future is Now, Connecting Leaders to the Ever-Evolving Project Management. And I'm thrilled and excited to say I'll be one of their keynote speakers, uh, along with Roger Haskett and Devinder Kumar. So I, if uh, you're going to be in the Toronto area on April 25th, it would be great to go out and register. You can go out to PMI SWOC Symposium. Dot com, get more information about the great lineup and also to register. So that's our announcements uh, before we get in with our special guests. I'm super excited. I've been looking forward to the show for a very long time. We have with us today Ruth Pierce and Michael Donnelly. So welcome, Ruth and Michael. Ruth, uh, we'll just give a, you a moment here to introduce yourself to the listeners and share with them a little bit about yourself, your story, and uh, anything that you have going on right now. Well, thank you very much, Joe, and it's a real privilege to be on the show. I've been looking forward to it myself. Um, I'm Ruth Pierce. I've been a project manager for a lifetime, but over 25 years. I was one of those people that accidentally became a project manager. My own project manager was deported in the middle of a project, and I was the technical lead at the time, and I was just asked to step up and do the project management, and that was it. I was in love with the role, so that was how I became a project manager. I'm now continuing to project manage. I project manage for the VIA Institute on Character, which you talk about your purpose-driven PMO. This really is a purpose-driven organization and it really aligns with my purpose. So that is absolutely wonderful for me to be doing project management for an organization like them. And I also speak and write. I had a book that came out at the end of last year for project managers on character strengths, which is actually what the VIA Institute on Character, surprise, surprise, actually specializes in. So I am having a fabulous time at the moment going from different speaking engagements and talking to different people and running workshops and doing all sorts of things. So I am I feel as though I've really come to a point in my career and my life where things have come together and I'm, I am working with a purpose. So I loved what you said about purpose-driven PMO. That just so aligns with how I feel I'm doing at the moment. Well, thanks so much, Ruth. And, and that story of your your accidental uh, entry into project management is in your book as well. So for those, we'll, we're going to talk a lot about your book during the show. So thanks for being with us. And Michael, thank you for being with us as well. Please introduce yourself to everybody. Well, thanks for having me, Joe. I'm real excited to be here. Love the show. I'm Michael Donnelly. 
I am a senior manager with Silicon Valley Bank. I'm in the enterprise PMO, the EPMO. From my background, like Ruth, I also consider myself an accidental project manager and an accidental PMO manager for that matter. I started out as a financial analyst in my corporate journey. And so I had a business role. And after that, I joined IT to do something about the systems. Let's just say they were less than user-friendly. Sure. And I um, uh, started out as a BASA role and my, my first project. And that grew quickly into being a project manager. So I was asked to do that and learn through some hard trials and errors. Hopefully, I could say I failed forward there. Um, that grew into leading more projects, leading programs, portfolios, and now PMO manager. That's fantastic. Uh, a, a journey that many in the project management space have followed, right? So I think a lot of people can relate to that that career path. Absolutely, yeah. I hope I can connect with a lot of the listeners here on just on those roles. Also, a reminder to everybody that we are live, and if you have a question for Ruth or Michael, you can reach us with a Twitter question. Uh, so if you tweet using hashtag PMO Joe, uh, we're monitoring Twitter, and we can get to those questions live on air. So let's get in and talk some project management. Uh, Ruth, we've we've talked about your book, uh, but we haven't got into any of the specifics. So be a project motivator. Unlock the Secrets of Strengths-Based Project Management. Can you share a little bit more about the book and kind of what was the impetus for you to write that? Yeah, actually, my favorite topic is the impetus for me to write it because it was my team. So I, over the years, I have focused a, a great deal on what engages teams, how to get people behind the purpose of a project, how to align projects with the people that are delivering those projects. I've experimented with a lot of different techniques. And it's, this is not to say that tools and process aren't important. This is just where I've focused my attention. And over the years, I'd sort of honed the, the practices I've used. I've got down to a few key tools that I use in order to build engagement and to help people connect with each other and to connect, as I said, with the purpose of the project. And then in one of my projects a few years ago, a couple of the team members came and said, you should write this you should write this down so other people can do it. And I was a little incredulous, to say the least. The idea of me writing a book seemed like a really crazy idea. So I started with a sort of white paper and I had a couple of people look at that. And my team kept saying, so where is it? What are you doing? Why haven't you written it yet? And so I decided to put it out there and see if I could get a publisher to pick it up. And they did. And so that was the impetus for the book was my own teams saying, we like what we've been doing. Share it with other people. That's fantastic. And I obviously, I want everybody to go get the book, so I don't want to do, give them all of the information in there. But can you give kind of the highlights, right, of course, as to what they can expect throughout the book? Yeah. So the common theme throughout the book is really focusing on what people bring to the table. What are their strengths? And there are all different types of strengths. People's talents are a form of strength. Their skills are a form of strength. And one of the things that I really focus on is this concept of character strengths, which are really our intrinsic motivators, which brings us back to this purpose. And so woven through the book is really a story of the practices. There's a there's a project manager called Maggie, and she's working with her team of BAs. It's actually based on an, uh, an IT project predominantly. And so she's got her entire team that she's working with. And so throughout the book is this theme of how do you pull out the best in these people and align their strengths with the tasks to be done on a project, to get the project done. And how do you boost their energy and boost their motivation? How does it impact communication, not just within the team, but also with stakeholders and with other teams that you might be integrating with? And so there's both a story and, an, and a practical application throughout the book. There's a series within the chapters. I have kind of little exercises and reflection tasks for the reader to do to be able to apply this to their own situation. And then the book wraps up with a 30-day plan, because this is for project managers, a 30-day plan for them to be able to implement this for themselves. And it's really kind of a six-step program. The first three steps are getting to know about your own strengths and figuring out how to apply those strengths, modeling those strengths to other people. And then it's about seeing strengths in other people, seeing how to align those with the project, and then really helping people to apply those strengths in a meaningful way. And what I love about this book, we're so focused on project management of the technical skills. And this has been probably a constant theme on many of our shows that we've had. 
where we talk about, you know, building a schedule and, and your communication plan and your governance plan, all the technical components of project management. But really, the things that you address in the book, Ruth, bring us towards from good to great, right? And Michael, I know you've uh, experienced this as well of how do we how do we take these soft skills or these non-technical skills to help project managers grow and, and become better at what they're doing? Yeah, I think it's a great question because the themes that are in Ruth's book, I think, are really essential for the great PMs where they are able to really recognize the team and that chemistry of the team going through the, the Tuckman models, you know, from forming and storming and arming and getting to a high-performing team. So recognizing the strengths and being able to pull the people together, um, reach that common goal, I think is such a paramount part of being a great PM and leading those great projects. And was there any, if within your personal career, right, starting out on, on the, the business side and, and working your way into project management, how did you reconcile the the business aspect, the project technical aspect, and then maybe the social, emotional, intelligence side of things? How, how does business, practical, and soft skills all come together? They all come together. Unfortunately for me, it was that trial and error. I was so focused, like you were getting at earlier, about just the scope, schedule, budget piece. I lost, or I didn't really have visibility initially to just why we wanted to have that project. So having, you know, what I learned later then is to be able to have that connection with the, the project sponsor and the business owner, having that common purpose to then connect with the team. And that was such a, an important piece of it because oftentimes the project team members, they're on several other projects. They have competing interests. Um, so getting everyone together and having that, that common purpose really helps alleviate some of those pain points. Um, I, I took a PM class a long time ago, and the, the leader told a story that still really resonates with me today about coming up with that common purpose, and it's such a, a powerful visual. Um, let me share that real quick, and then I'll circle back with how to make that practical. So it, it's a parable, so bear with me for a second. But um, it's, uh, So there's a major storm outside that knocked out the power to half the city. And the local news agency was out covering the storm, and they go to a utility worker, say, hey, can you tell our viewers, what are you doing? And the worker just looks really weathered and just wind coming in from the sideways. He says, well, I'm replacing some of these switches, I'm resetting this, this router here, and you know, just go through this checklist and something clicks. Meanwhile, across town, uh, another local news agency is asking the same question, and that reporter smiles and says, I'm restoring power to half the city so their families can have dinner tonight. You know, so as a PM, which utility worker do you want on your project team? And that really starts with the project. It starts with the project manager, in this case, and also with a PMO manager, if, if they have a team of PMs. And creating that common purpose is such an enormous, um, such an essential piece of that. So how to make that practical? Um, so as a PM, you've got a great tool with a charter. But the question is, is it a tool or is it just an artifact that goes into your project repository and you don't really do anything with it? Uh, do you have benefits that are really quantified and powerful and impact that tie to your strategic objectives, that tie to what the business really wants. And are you constantly looking at that and testing, and testing, hey, is this really the right thing to do for the business? And using that in your day-to-day, in, in, um, and you can also do something really simple, something really subtle, just having a, a common tagline, like a um, really powerful statement that you can put on your PowerPoint slide deck on the cover sheet, like um, Till Respa Project, saving the bank a million dollars a month. Something just really subtle. You don't have to go through it every time, but you just connect that, you create that connection with everyone. I think that's fantastic for us to be able to picture the two. And we've both, we've been in that situation where we've been both utility workers, right? Right. And we wish we answered like the second afterwards and you can't go back and do that, right? You, you always have the first answer. So, I mean, I've, I've been there myself, so it's very conscious of us to be able to be thinking of our messaging and how we're communicating. And I think, Ruth, that right, that ties into your character strengths, right, and understanding it does. what to do. Yeah, I was just thinking as Michael was talking, that I, I love that parable. And there's research that shows the differences in how people see their work, depending on how they align their strengths to their work. So there's tons of research in the workplace about using character strengths. And I was thinking of the research that was done with hospital workers, specifically cleaners, And they found that some cleaners saw their job as a way to make enough to pay the rent and get their kids fed. And and basically, they were getting through the day. And then there were other workers who saw other cleaners within the hospital who saw their job as being an integral part of the health care of the patient because they were keeping the environment clean. They were making it safer for the patient. They were often the person that 
the patient conversed with because they spent more time in the room, actually cleaning the room. And very often for patients that were there for a long stay, that was a point of human connection for them. And these people really saw their cleaning job as a calling. And when what the research showed was it was because they knew what their core strengths were, kindness and judgment and a lot of humanity strengths like love and social intelligence. They knew that about themselves and they were leveraging those strengths to make that connection to the person, but also to make that connection to their role within the hospital's team. That's what we see with people who get to know their character strengths and are more mindful about how they use them, is that they start to align themselves more closely with the purpose of the project. Now, one of the things that comes up a lot when people are asking me about um, what I talk about and what I teach and and what I've written about is it all it can seem a little bit sort of Pollyanna-ish, it's all positive and we're going to focus on our strengths and all of that kind of stuff. And that's not what this is about at all. It is about finding out where our powerhouse is and leveraging that. And sometimes what happens is when people come to be aware of their strengths, they actually realize they don't align with the purpose of the project or they don't align with the purpose of the organization. And someone emailed me recently, a couple of days ago, after a presentation I did, and she said she had just quit her job right before she saw my presentation. And what she'd realized when she saw the character strengths was that the organization she had departed from didn't align with the strengths that were core to her, the essential energizing, effortless strengths that were so meaningful to her. That alignment wasn't there. And now she knew what she was going to be looking for when she searched for her next job. So that sense of who you really are, what your core motivators are, and whether that aligns with the project and the purpose of the organization and the culture of the organization is extremely meaningful and extremely powerful and strangely simple to engage once you know about it. Yeah, and I I think back, right, we we all start as in our youth, exposed a lot of us to youth sports. As you go through, for instance, it's baseball season here in Arizona, and they look at the, the kids out on the field and who can throw at, you know, the eight, nine, 10 year old, who can actually throw a strike and, and get it over home plate. That strength is, is accentuated and brought to the team and the team benefits by the player who can do that well. Whereas if we found somebody who had a challenge to be able to throw a strike and we said, well, that's a weakness and we're going to try to improve that for you. You can do that, but you don't do that during the game, right? You're not going to let them lead the project as they're trying to figure out how to lead a project. So I love the fact that we take the people with strengths, put them in those positions to be able to lead the team and provide that guidance based on what their strengths are. Too often, I think we focus on how do we make our weaknesses stronger and forget that our strengths are are what make us who we are. Exactly. And one of the things I always like to ask people is if you're playing to someone's strengths If you've got two people, one person who's been told that they have a gap or a weakness or something they need to work on, and then you've got someone else where you've really highlighted the positives about them and what they bring to the table, who's more motivated to actually work on their weaknesses? Because we all have weaknesses. We all have things that we need to improve. We may have skills that we're lacking in order to do what we need to do on the project. And what I find is that people who are engaging their character strengths are more motivated to work on boosting other strengths, skills and elevating their talents and so on. The person who's been told you have a gap and you should work on that, they're demoralized and demotiva- demotivated. And it's, it isn't so easy to get that person behind getting the training. So people are more likely to put the effort into learning what they need to know if they feel that the things that are core to them are being engaged every day in the workplace. Yeah, so, so Ruth, I love the whole theme with the book and the concept of the book. I'm a big fan of Strength Finder, done that survey and was able to utilize some of those, those pieces on the team, but it still wasn't a really natural fit. I still had to kind of force it into it. And as a PM, if I put myself in, in their shoes, if I had that Strength Finder survey from all the team members, yes, it would help. But what I think yours does is, it seems like it blends that in so much more for a practical use from a, from a PM perspective and the character strengths that can you really apply on day, on day one. Can you get into, though, more on just how you utilize that, especially some of the, the tools that you have from the, um, the, the plan that you have for, for the PMs and, the, and, their, and just their, their exercises that you have them do? Because I'm really curious about how, sure. that, how you get to that. Yeah, thank you, Michael, for asking that. So I just wanted to say that Strengths Finder, the Clifton Strengths tool is something that a lot of workplace people are familiar with. And that that tool, I'm actually certified in that as well. So I'm, I'm very familiar with it. That tool to me measures more how people operate in the workplace. 
And the VIA character strengths tool is more who they are at their core. And bringing those two together can be absolutely amazing. If you do that in a workshop or a training or something like that, that can be a really nice blend. But in terms of practical application, one of the biggest things that I see that really works is just to start spotting strengths, to get the list. So there's a list of 24 character strengths that we are all endowed with to some degree or other. Even our lowest strengths, we have some of that strength. So the the survey doesn't measure weaknesses. It only measures the degree to which the 24 strengths show up in you. Get that list and sit and watch people and see from the descriptions. And they're very accessible descriptions. It's love and kindness and judgment and curiosity and creativity. They're all things that most of us have a pretty good clue as to what those strengths mean, you know, what those words mean. And just highlight for yourself what you think you see in people. And my favorite place to do it is a meeting. So any meeting that it's not me that's having to orchestrate the meeting, I love to sit and listen to what people are saying, especially if it's a meeting where I think I'm going to get bored or frustrated. And then I focus on how are they delivering their message? What are they saying? What kind of words are they using? Are they softer words, more like heart strength words, or are they tougher words that are more sort of mind strength, data driven kind of comments that they're making? And then I'll go up to them afterwards and thank them for sharing, you know, thank them for doing something using one of the strengths. And the magic thing about this is you don't actually have to be right because we all have all the strengths to some degree. I've never experienced anyone saying, you saw kindness in me. You know, I don't, I don't want you to think I'm kind or you saw good judgment, critical thinking in me. I don't want to be thought of as someone that can weigh different options and come to a rational conclusion. But what happens is if you go and make these comments to people, and it's just like any other kind of feedback, be specific, you know, so I really appreciated the kindness that you showed today when you stepped up to help so-and-so who is behind on their work because of that family crisis they had, you know, so what did you see? How did you see them demonstrating it? They take that in and what you'll see is they start doing it for other people. And it becomes this ripple effect that is just so simple to engage. You don't need to go to the length of getting everyone to take the assessment or anything. Just start using your natural powers of observation and use a little bit of bravery to speak up and say what you see. And and I don't do it in the meeting. You know, I don't sort of suddenly shine a spotlight on them in the meeting and make a spectacle of them. I just take them aside afterwards and say, you know, I really appreciated that in you today. And it's just amazing how that moves through the team and people start to connect more. They start to see each other's strengths more. And it just becomes a natural process of appreciating the positive aspects of the people who are around you. And that's a it's a very, it's a very small change. It goes to all the theories around habit change, you know, making small changes. So there's work by all the 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 book by um, Charles Duhigg about habits. And then there's the work by James Clear, the book by him about called Atomic Habits. They all come down to make a very small change and make it consistently. And other changes ripple out from that. And so that that's the biggest tip really is to is to start spotting strengths, practice spotting strengths. And as you get better at spotting them in other people, you'll actually get more comfortable in seeing them in yourself as well. And once you start seeing them in yourself, you can cultivate them. What I like about what I just heard there um, is that one is going to reinforce that behavior. So you can see that behavior over and over again. Love that. But I also love that you're creating that that team bond, that 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 team just connection because you have that empathy that's being shown over and over again. And then you're building in that, that trust. And, and then you can actually apply that to projects when you have to get really the, the candid, hard conversations. How you might have to deal with some trade-offs or have to deal with um, certain things that aren't going very well. Um, and oftentimes it deals with the team dynamics there. So be able to have that established connection right, with that trust is, is just essential. So I, I like that, that path to, to get there. Yeah, the trust building is so important. And I'd love to know from you, Michael, you were saying that a lot of the sort of team dynamic stuff has been, um, and figuring out how to make a PMO work and everything has been trial and error. What, what successes have you had and how did you get there? You know, what thing, because I love this idea that, you know, we learn from trying things and failing and then figuring out how to do it better. What what were some of the things that along the way you feel that maybe you tripped up on, but you learned from and did differently in the future? Yeah, great question. Um, so in setting up a PMO, I think that there's 
an aspirational vision to be able to, to have a great PMO, right? So what does that mean? And how, how do you get there? Um, to me, I try to keep it simple and measurable. And I look at two, two aspects of it. So one is, do you have that aligned vision, mission, and strategy to, to everyone that, that you play a part with? So that's internal from your team and, and also your business partners that are going to consume that service. Um, so where I tripped up on was really getting that alignment up, for, up front and getting everyone really on board and creating that, that environment to, to really challenge that and, and to want to know that, hey, it's not going to happen overnight, but we're going to get there. And it, it's okay that we maybe stumble a little bit to get there, but let's get there. Um, and, and the second way to, to really tie it all together and have the delivery aspect of that is, is that are you really continuously sought after? Um, so a couple of quick measure points then. So as a PMO leader, you're asking internally from the team that you have, what's your retention rate? Um, how, what's your referral rate? How many people on your team are actually trying to promote other friends to be there? And if you don't have that, because um, a couple of times when I was tripped up, we had some environments that, that were just not really a good place, right? We had some growing pains. And when we were trying to fill some PM slots, more than one person had said, well, I'm not comfortable bringing on some of my friends because it's not really a good fit for them right now. Right, which is code for you have a toxic environment, so fix it first. So, so that was that was those are some great learning points from there. And then from a business partner aspect, I think a, a simple but most uh, great, really powerful tool is just a partner of choice survey. So, reaching out to them and, and just saying, "Hey, if you can go anywhere, would you still come to me?" Um, and I'll give you two examples of where where that didn't happen. You know, I didn't have that alignment. I didn't have that continuous um, sought after piece. So, one was um, I was actually sought after. Great. Then they asked, a business partner asked, well, hey, Michael, I'd like to get a PM. Um, probably should take no more than 10% of their time. Just need them to create a project plan, like a Gantt chart, and run a weekly status meeting and make sure everyone's collecting all those tasks and getting it done. So my gut was saying, okay, so you want a Gantt jockey and a cat herder. Not really aligned to where I'm trying to go with the, the vision and the mission, right? So we had a disconnect there. So I didn't have that alignment there. Um, so stumbling there to make sure I had a conversation to, to get to that alignment. Another business partner had had that same conversation on uh, just am I, am I the partner of choice? And it was really enlightening to to see that, um, that, yeah, they were sought after, but I had to be honest with myself. I was really the only game in town because I had the funding and I had the uh, the prioritized resources as part of my PMO. Um, so, of course, if they wanted something done, they had to come through, through my PMO. Um, but when I asked that question and said, okay, well, if you remove funding from the equation, if you remove the resource prioritization from the equation, would I still be the partner of choice? And the business partner looked in the eye and she said, no, your projects take too long. And your PMs are so focused on, on just delivering to a schedule and a contract, like a business requirements document, that we end up having too many change requests. We have too many dot releases, like dot one release, dot two release, dot, two, dot three release to actually get what I want. Um, so yes, that had some hard reflection. And first, let me clarify, that's not on the PM, right? That's on me because I'm creating that culture. I'm creating that environment. So that's the stumbling piece to, to make sure that we have... Um, that connection with the alignment to the vision and the mission and that strategy, but also that you are continuously sought after right? and using those partner of choice type surveys to realize well, if I'm not there yet, well, then something's wrong with my delivery, something's wrong with my vision and mission alignment there. So we need a course correct to get there. Yeah, what I love about that, Michael, is you're, you're driving for purpose. Absolutely. You're, you're seeking out why you're needed and not the how, because you got the answer on the how. You're, you're too overweight, right? You're overburdened. You take too long, right? They were answering the how components of it because you weren't answering the why components of it. So it fits in great with uh, purpose-driven PMO and what we've been talking about here. Yeah, and even on, on the vision, it's also thinking a step ahead. So if you're looking from the business-driven purpose, how are you staying ahead of where the business is trying to go? And how are you going to add value and meet that, that, um, that future state? So how are you constantly ad- evolving and adapting and being flexible to realize that, hey, I can't just stay status quo. I'm going to constantly need to grow my services, grow my team, um, and meet, meet where the business is going. Right? So moving at the speed of business. So that, that's where the vision comes into play. But then it comes into, well, is the team really aligned to that? Um, I had a couple of stumblings where there were some, some PMs that were nervous with that because it was a big change. I made the assumption that they would be all rah-rah, let's go. Let's, yeah, that sounds great. But the feedback that I got right away was, well, gosh, what if we don't get there, right? Then, then it's gonna be, we're being penalized. So what I learned from there is that I needed to create that, that trust to say, well, here's how we're going to get there. But we're also going to recognize that it's not going to happen overnight. And we're going to really create an environment where we can be innovative. We can try things. 
And you're not going to be penalized for trying something, but learning about it and not being able to do something with it. So making sure that if you're going to create an audacious goal, great, but make sure you have that environment for the safety and that trust to get the team to rally behind and, and, and go there and actually have them be part of that vision, have them make sure that they're providing input to steer where to go to as well. So they feel connected. They feel that they have stake in the game and it's not just a top down throw out of where you want to go. Yeah, and, and Ruth, as I'm hearing Michael talk about this, right, it, it brings me back to we've had some other guests on our show that uh, Belinda Goodrich, for example, had talked about social and emotional intelligence and the importance of that. What's the your perspective on right, the relationship between emotional intelligence and social intelligence with project management? So uh, to me, emotional intelligence is kind of a broader concept. So emotional intelligence combines that self-awareness, self-regulation, the ability to understand and describe and then manage our own emotions in a given situation. And social intelligence is that uh, is specifically, oh, sorry. And so that's half of emotional intelligence. And I think the other half is the overlap with social intelligence, which is that awareness of other people, uh, seeing what they're trying to communicate, hearing them being effective in the way you listen, being effective in the way that you get information across to other people. So emotional intelligence is kind of that own self and others view. And social intelligence is really sort of directed at other people. Um, one of the things I was struck by as Michael was talking was that tremendous, which I think reflected social intelligence and emotional intelligence, but also bravery in going to people and saying, am I the partner of choice, taking that risk that they say no? And then when you get that answer that you want, I mean, who doesn't want to hear, yes, I'm, you're the partner of choice. You know, I would, I would pick you. You could just, you know, say, that's it. I've asked the question. I've got the answer and go off. But you avoided that confirmation bias of just accepting the first answer because it's the one you want and went deeper and said, well, the reality is you haven't got much choice. So if you had choice, would your answer still be the same? And being brave enough to face the possibility and hearing the outcome that the answer was no, you know, and doing something about it. And I think that is, that's emotional intelligence because it was listening to the other person, being sensitive to their needs, but also managing, Michael was managing his own reaction to that, managing his own interpretation of what he heard back. And that's that emotional intelligence piece. The social intelligence was how he engaged with that other person, being focused on hearing from them, clarifying their message and so on. I hope that answers the question. There's a sort of subtle difference. And I think emotional intelligence to me is more all-encompassing than the strength of social intelligence. Yeah. And I, you know, I, it, I love practical application because the listeners are have all walked in our shoes, right? They're listening for a reason, and to to share those stories of of reality help them. So, Michael, dig in one layer deeper now and say, what are some of the barriers that you run into, right? And and then how do you overcome barriers of an enterprise PMO as you work with your moving at the speed of business? I love that line. Sure. So, several barriers. For, for projects, right? They're, I think every project almost starts out with a thousand reasons why they're going to fail on, on day one. So tying in with, with emotional intelligence there, where I see one that the PM has to deal with right away is, is that you're going to have change. That's the whole reason why the PM is there is to manage that change. Oftentimes that change gets to an adverse um, state, right? We, we may not um, be going as planned, right? So are you constantly planning? Um, are you dealing with issues? And so I think where you see that emotional intelligence come into play is, well, how, how does the PM create that, that team um, environment and what, what's their initial reaction when there is something that is not planned? Right? Are they immediately jumping down someone's throat because, well, how could that possibly be? Or are they like, okay, there's an issue. What are we going to do about it? And having that, that awareness to say, hey, how I'm reacting to the team is going to transpire and everyone's going to feed off of that. So they're going to get to the triage and get to the issues and then learn later. Um, so that's just, that's just one aspect of it. Um, several other pitfalls, you know, in terms of just, do you have that, that trust in, in the environment to really call a spade a spade? Um, uh, you want to avoid the, I call it like the, you know, I've heard from, um, from others was, um, the watermelon project, you know, where it's green on the outside, but red on the inside. Well, often that is because there is a, a culture environment where presenting bad news is bad and as opposed to how do you present it in a case where, Hey, it's a call for help. It's to realizing that, hey, the team by itself, we need more help and we need to raise that awareness. So be able to make sure, do you have, have you created that, 
that environment that have that trust where you can have that discussion, be very candid and, and look at calling something red or amber or, or, or yellow. It's a good thing to, to have that up front so you can actually address it before it becomes too late. Yeah, I like that. And, um, you know, it got me to think back to your prior answer as well. Combined, you talk about motivation in there, right? And being able as a, the PMO leader to be able to be the conduit to your business stakeholders, but then take with the input you've given and then be able to motivate your team to achieve what your vision and mission are. And Ruth, you talk in the book quite a bit about um, obviously the title being a project motivator. Can you share a little bit more about your thoughts around that? So it really comes back to understanding, for me, it comes back to understanding what motivates the individuals that you're working with. You know, what's what's at their core and what's why are they there? What made them be in this organization doing this project? And you can look at the superficial level and say, well, they were hired by the organization because it was close enough to work and they can they can commute and they chose that job for for um practical reasons like I said earlier, you know, paying the mortgage or putting clothes on their children's back or whatever it might be. And those are very important motivators, but there's a level below those. So that below that taking care of your children is love, you know, and kindness and to some degree social intelligence and judgment that 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 priority is more important than some other priority, like living on a desert island somewhere and not having to work at all. And when you connect to those underlying core motivators that people have, you can connect that to the project as well. Although, as I said earlier, sometimes you can't. You know, so I've seen people who've become more aware of what matters to them and they've realized they're in the wrong place doing the wrong thing, you know, and they've resigned or looked for some other role within the organization. Um, but really understanding the drivers for the individual and then helping them see how those drivers can help bring success on the project creates this motivation. There's also the community, the the sort of camaraderie aspect that Michael mentioned earlier. As we get to know each other at a deeper level, we connect more with each other. And people are very driven to help their community. You know, they're very driven to help their tribe. And if you can make the team bond together, then very often they will take on the goals of the project collectively, you know, and help each other achieve that. But that comes from knowing each other and understanding what matters, you know. So I am not, I always give this example. I know for a lot of people, having a very close relationship with family is extremely important. For me personally, I love my, don't get me wrong, I love my family. And if they're listening to this, they may be tilting their heads on one side and saying, what is she saying? <laughs> but I love my family, but I also love my connections with the people I work with. And they're fleeting. You know, they come and go. I work with a team of people. We may work together for a year or two years or five years, and then I move on to the next thing and it's a new team. But I really love those connections with people. I love getting to know what matters most to them and then helping them bring what matters most to their work so that they feel engaged in work. That's my passion. I love it. So everybody's a little different, you know, in in what motivates them. And we have a tendency, it's natural human instinct, you know, it's heuristics to try and impose patterns and say, these are the patterns. People do things for this reason, this reason, this reason, this reason. But the, but the beauty of getting to individuals' motivators is that you can create a much stronger team than if you just put this sort of blanket pattern over people and say, well, people are here because they need to pay for somewhere to live and they need to pay to eat. And there's more to why people are in their jobs than just meeting their basic needs, unless they really are, you know, it's sort of Maslow's hierarchy, right? Unless they really are at a very um, challenged state in terms of their poverty level. For most of us working in fields where there are project managers, People are not just there because they need to pay the bills. They ha they need something more than that to motivate them to be in work. And finding out what that is at that personal level is the secret to getting them behind the project and behind the organization and making things happen. Yeah, I love, Ruth, what you're saying about relationships and, and what you called earlier with having that, that bond. If I go back to my very first project, this was over 20 years ago, I still connect with a lot of people from that team, right? Because we really had that that bond it was a very transformational project, a lot of pain points, but we were in it together and we all had that common purpose. Um, so we had a, like a band of brothers type um, connection there and where I still connect. 
still reach out to them and and and, and vice versa. So having that, that that type of relationship on on any project is definitely aspirational. It's not always attainable, sure, but but I think that's what to me separates a lot of the, the good PMs from the great PMs is when they have those relationships, and especially even PMO managers when they can really lean on, on everyone and have that uh, even like a, a servant leadership type mentality there to to build those relationships, put everyone else first, um, but really aspire to to build the team up um, through those relationships. You're going to create that, that that greater good. To be able to to do that, obviously, it takes a lot of challenge. I mean, it takes a lot a lot of work and a lot of those connections that you were talking about, Ruth. So, but but to me, mm-hmm. that that is an essential piece of, of re- leading a great project and leading a great PMO. Michael, I'm wondering, right, uh, obviously great background, great successes, great examples. What else can you share with us about being a PMO leader to help build a, an effective PMO? Can you share with everyone? Sure. The one that, that really comes to my mind is is how are you creating that environment for success? I, I look at you know, we talked about just having a, a clear vision and mission and strategy that everyone's really aligned to, but you have to look at yourself to say that sometimes you might be the the roadblock or the barrier. So if you're so focused on certain metrics, you know, metrics drive the behavior, um, is that the behavior that you're really aspiring for? So for example, if you're so focused on the governance on just how many red projects do you have and did you do these templates, right? You're, you're, you're essentially, you're creating a, an environment where red is bad and all you're focused on is just creating these artifacts, those, those templates. So you have like a, a checklist drivers and you find that your team might become really good at creating checklists and they lose some of the, the art of creating value, right? So you have to really be careful of what environment are you really setting in, in those behaviors and those metrics. PMO, a while ago, we changed some of the metrics. So instead of just counting the number of red projects we had, we started looking at how many days in red a project was in. You know, that changes the conversation because now a PM is no longer concerned or they, there's no longer fear of calling it red because now the spotlight is actually on the leadership team and the management team to, to help remove some of those barriers because they're calling for help. So what are you going to do about getting that? Right? So how are you creating that environment for, for that trust and realize that you, as a PMO manager, you're going to provide the air cover when things aren't going well. But again, you want to be able to make sure that you have that, that trust there. I love uh, that description, and, and I think it ties back into everything you've been sharing with us, right, is the a sense of disruption from the way things have normally been done, right? We think of PMOs, and we, we can all picture the dashboard of the list of projects, scope, budget, and timeline, red, yellow, green, goes up to executives, they look at it, and they say, what am I going to do with this? But what you've described is you've gone beyond that. Right, you've sought out your stakeholders. You've sought out the input they need, and you've adjusted your processes to be successful. So, certainly appreciate sharing that with the audience because I I know it's working very well for your organization. Uh, Ruth, when, when I was going through the book, I love the book. It, it's it's motivated me as I'm reading the book. Uh, but there's a line in there that uh, it says the book will help lift you from being a manager of tasks to a project motivator or a motivator of people, rather. How, how does the book, and again, how does that book lead you to motivating people? Well, you really like to ask the difficult questions. Can, <laughs> I, can I just go right on back to what Michael was saying before? Because I think there was such a wealth of, course. of, of what he was saying. I mean, I love that um, insight into metrics. You know, when we establish metrics, people come, become really, really good achieving the metrics and lose touch with what the metrics were supposed to be trying to inform us about. And this concept of news, you know, so a, a red project is perceived as bad news. It News is just news, and it becomes bad news when we interpret it that way. And I love Michael's interpretation that a red project is a cry for help. You know, it's a piece of news saying, hey, look over here. You know, we need something other than what we've got at the moment to make to bring this back on track. And just seeing it as news and then determining what's the next step, you know, is really, um, is really, I think, very powerful. So I loved what Michael had to say. How will the book help you to go from being a manager of tasks to a motivator of people? It takes the focus and it, it's one of the things that's uh, it's difficult because there's only so much any one person can pay attention to, right? So I pay my attention with project managers to this kind of behavioral aspect of project management, understanding people's motivation, getting on, getting them on board with what we're trying to do. And as I said at the beginning, it's not to say that checklists and Gantt charts and all the artifacts that we produce for 
projects as long as they're used as tools and not just check the box that the artifact has been created. I'm not in any way saying that those things aren't important, but I think there are people far better than me that can describe how to create those and make them work effectively. In terms of taking the focus away from tasks, what I've found is that when we focus on what makes people tick, what gets them energized. And basically, if you, if you do take the assessment, the VIA character strengths assessment, it gives you a ranking of these 24 strengths. They're universal strengths recognized by all cultures, all religions around the world. It's, it's an amazing tool that was really well researched in the in early 2000s. If you do take the survey and find out you know, what people are really engaged by. It's their top five strengths are regarded as signature strengths. And they're the ones that are essential to them. They're kind of effortless to engage. They feel most like them and they're actually energizing. You know, so if you're a curious person, for example, finding out about something new, hearing something intriguing, asking another question. Michael earlier asked another question when he'd got his answer to to the survey he'd sent out. He asked another question to find out more. That curiosity is really engaging and satisfying to the person. If curiosity isn't one of your top five strengths, then the burden of constantly having to ask more questions may be too much, you know. And so to find that out about people and to find out what their top five strengths are, if that's just what you focus on, and help them really engage them in work naturally turns the attention to motivation. And the tasks become something they want to get done, that they take care of themselves. I found as I focused more on this other people became, they took ownership of their own tasks more, you know, because they felt engaged and aligned with what they were doing. They felt seen and recognized. And so your focus can move away from constantly tracking tasks and create this, to creating this environment that Michael's talking about, creating this environment of appreciation and recognition and seeing people for who they are so that the rest of it, I don't want to say takes care of itself, but almost you know, it almost becomes secondary to actually make things happen because people get behind what they're doing. And the book shows you how to do that by using the example of a team. And it's a blend of the teams I've worked with over the years. Some people may recognize certain parts of of what I talk about in the book. And it gives demonstrations of how you engage those strengths. It gives examples of where a strength may get overused, you know, and it may get in the way of other team members because it's not being used in the most beneficial in an optimal way. And it and it demonstrates, the book is demonstrating how you can take this information and apply it in a project environment. So using hopefully one of my strengths of curiosity, I'm going to come back to Michael's example about the days being read. What happened from going, you were originally reporting number of read projects mm-hmm. to then the duration that the projects were read? What was the impetus for you making that change? Well, the impetus was, again, trying to change the behavior so it wasn't on the PM shoulders. It was to show that it, there's a, a village approach, that we all have a role to play um, as leaders, as, as managers, uh, to, to help make those projects successful, to make the PM successful. And so the the impetus was trying to make sure that we had others really vested in bringing stake in the game, really in that, hey, there's more than, than what the project team can do to solve this issue and some more help is needed. So being able to have a tool and to have that conversation then with, with other groups or other leaders to say, we actually, we need your help. We need you to, to go talk to the supplier, this vendor, since you own that relationship. Um, but then also as, as it would go to, as that message would be elevated up through um, the different channels, that spotlight then also shifted away from just the project manager, but to, to other teams, other leadership teams to help be part of, of that, that course correction. And and what was the reaction from the team, but also from the stakeholders, right? The sponsors. Definitely saw a positive reaction from project managers um, because, again, it was no longer just on their shoulders. Sure. And it was a change for some of the other leaders because they, their still reaction was, well, what are you doing about it? But then it was still realizing I could redirect it back to them to say, well, this is why we need your help, right? And we want to make sure that these projects are not still spinning and this is what we need you to be able to do. And we find that that most leaders, I've yet to really see a leader that doesn't want to help. Um, But they're often wondering, well, how can I help? So give me something, give me, give me something that's tangible that I can work with. Um, Because if you just say, oh, I need your support. Well, everyone's going to give you a thumbs up, but being able to tie that to action is, is always the, the missing art to that. And so then this becomes that conversation on being able to say, well, this is what stuck is what we need you to be able to do. 
and realizing that it's something it often requires more than one person to do. And then at least you didn't have a vehicle then to have that conversation with, with multiple people. Yeah, the what are you going to do about it turned into what are we going to do about it. Absolutely. I love that. All right. Well, we have, again, come to the end of another fantastic show. I mean, I could keep going on for like another hour of this discussion. So maybe we bring you guys back again uh, to keep this going. This is, I think we've just touched the tip of the iceberg with both of you, and it's been fantastic. So thank you for being with me. Uh, Ruth, we'll start with you, give you another opportunity here to say how our listeners can be in touch with you. Uh, are there anything that you have going on? Where can they pick up your book? Anything you want to share with the listeners? So I would love for people to pick up the book. That would be great. And uh, I was told at the beginning of the show to remind you, Joe, to review it. <laughs> of on course. Amazon. So you can get it on Amazon. It's on Barnes & Noble. It's in print and Kindle or print and electronic version at the moment. So Kindle for Amazon, Nook for Barnes & Noble and other outlets as well. In mid-April, there will also be an audiobook version. So I'm just waiting for them to complete the recording on that. So any of the usual places to find the book, it's Be a Project Motivator, Unlock the Secrets of Strengths-Based Project Management. I love to connect with project managers, whether it be live or over the internet. So the best way to connect with me is through LinkedIn. And just to look for me, Ruth Pierce, I am more than happy to connect there, answer questions and, you know, help people find out more about their character strengths. And the other thing to do is to go to my website, which is projectmotivator.com, Project Motivator, all one word. Um, and if you'd like to see me speak, you know, and actually engage with me directly that way, then there's an events page on there and you can see where I'm speaking the rest of the year. I've got quite a full dance card, I'm pleased to say. So I'd love to see any of your audience members show up and quiz me, come and challenge me with questions on how you can use character strengths in your environment. Well, thanks so much for finding time to come with us. I, I know you are in demand and we appreciate getting your time. And also personally, uh, since we've connected, you've made uh, several connections for me uh, with others as well. So I'm very appreciative of that. And thank you all that you've done for both for the show and of course uh, for me personally. So thank you, Ruth. Oh, you're most welcome. Thank you very much, Joe. And Michael, same uh, for you. How can listeners get in touch with you and anything else that you want to share with them? The best way to reach me is on LinkedIn. So Michael Donnelly, PGMP. There are a few Michael Donnellys. I definitely love to connect. Uh, I geek out on this stuff, project management, PMO. So love to hear your trials, tribulations, what worked well for you as, as a PMO or as a project manager, especially for those that are driving some agile transformations that may not be going so well. That's a big fascination of mine. Um, although I don't have a book, definitely going to be picking up um, Bruce's book. I love what you're, everything that you have on, on strengths. Um, so that, that ties in really well with with my beliefs and, and definitely look forward to that. Yep, Thank you very much, Michael. It's great to have you on and also great to hear all of the insights that you have that are working because practical knowledge is what we're missing in the PMO space. Of course, there's lots of exams out there, PMP and the CAPM and others for the project manager but not a lot for the PMO. So I think getting guests on who are leadership positions and doing what you're doing is a big help to the audience. So thank you so much for joining us. Also want to say thank you to all our listeners. Uh, we recently passed 3 million plays and downloads of the podcast, which in the grand scheme of things means I don't know. It's a number, it's a statistic that we're measuring, and it's fantastic. It, I think it means people are listening. So that's Sounds great. great. A reminder, also, we are live the first and third Thursday each month. Our next show will be April 4th, the day before my birthday, so that'll be a celebration day. We're going to have Judy Umless and Jason Qualick with us, and also that these shows are recorded. So we are live, but we also release the shows as a podcast. So please subscribe to Project Management Office Hours on Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Spreaker, Stitcher, whatever your podcast platform of choice is. Thank you to our, our sponsor also, the PMO Squad. Basically, we're trying to rework the thinking about traditional project management. The PMO has long been the project management office, and we're working to change that into purpose, measure, and optimize. As we discussed today, find the why, measure your results to it, and then optimize to ensure you're achieving your results. So that's it for now. Office hours are closed. Until next time, I'm PMO Joe, and you've been listening to Project Management Office Hours. Mm -hmm.